Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to day two, Diana Initiative 2022, both here in Vegas, and we've got folks online. So if you're online, make sure that uh, you're also in the Discord because our presenter today, uh, yes, I am here to give our presenter those questions from Discord. Uh, our presenter today, uh, is uh, actually from one of our sponsors. We have many sponsors. We have sponsors here. You see the card up here. We're very thankful for our sponsors. And uh, uh, Priam is offensive security researcher at Intel, one of our sponsors here. And uh, she earned her PhD in computer science from Purdue University. Uh, her areas of expertise include secure system development via fuzzing, sanitization, uh, static and dynamic analysis, uh, she also worked with different organizations to promote diversity and inclusion in tech. I think that's all things we, we this is what we want to hear more about. Uh, today, Priam is going to talk about a dynamic code analysis technique named fuzzing, which has been widely proven successful in bug hunting. And she'll give us a walkthrough on the basics of fuzzing, its challenges, and how to resolve those challenges. So without further ado, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. That was nice. So hello again. I'm Priyam, and I'm very glad to be here today. I know it's pretty early in the morning, but I hope you all got your caffeine. So let's buckle up and start our talk. So today I'm going to talk about a very interesting topic, fuzzing. And we'll take you to a journey where we'll learn more about different specs of fuzzing, how can we use it, and different challenges and the best practices for using fuzzing. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Bangladesh. Uh, I came to US for my higher study. I did my PhD uh, from Purdue University in system security. Then in 2020, I joined Intel as an offensive security researcher. At Intel, I work in different domains, starting from software security to firmware security and hardware security, both on the attack and defense side. And fun fact about me, I'm a huge manga fan. I read a lot of mangas. Any manga fan here? Nice, high five. So yeah, my favorite manga is Spy Family. So outline, uh, I already mentioned a bit about it. So we are going to talk about fuzzing, uh, all the different types of fuzzing, how can we best use fuzzing using sanitizers, challenges, and our best practices. So fuzzing, we know like we are all security researchers, security engineers, security analysts here in Vegas, uh, virtually. So bug hunting uh, without fuzzing, no, no, that's a big no. But bug hunting with fuzzing, that's a big yes. And we will explore why bug hunting with fuzzing is a must and should be a, uh, like a part of the software, secure software development cycle. Now, why fuzzing? Software can be buggy. Bugs are everywhere. It can be in a small piece of code. It can be in a huge uh, code base like Chromium, Linux, but not. So bugs are everywhere and we cannot deny it. And we need good defense mechanism to make our code base bug free. We need defense, we need tools and techniques to find these bugs. We all have unit testing, feature testing as part of our uh, software development cycle, but this unit testing and feature testing are not enough to find all the bugs in your code base. There are tools, techniques like different static analysis tools but they lack precision because static analysis tools, they don't have the runtime information. So here comes fuzzing. A bit uh, context uh, about fuzzing with traditional testing. Let's start with uh, manual analysis, which means doing code review. That means you have a security engineer, security researcher going to your code and see, look for different patterns of bugs in your code. This is good. And then there is unit testing, property testing to understand how your code is doing. 
But this is not enough. When we are talking about millions of lines of code, a security researcher, a human person is not enough to find all the bugs in your code. So this is not scalable to the scale of like millions of lines of codes. Then comes static analysis. It's automated. We can scale it. Uh, we can find bugs with all these static analysis tools. But the problem is it doesn't have the runtime context. So it will miss a lot of uh, bugs and will suffer from false positive issues. That means it will target a particular pattern as a bug, but which is not, in fact, a bug. Then comes dynamic analysis, which means we'll have the runtime context. We have more precision. But the problem is that uh, it, it might take a lot of time. And fuzzing falls between in this dynamic analysis domain with other techniques like memory monitoring, uh, DCC or LLVM sanitizers. The point is that uh, this, all these approaches, manual analysis, static analysis, uh, we cannot replace uh, uh, these techniques with fuzzing, but fuzzing augments all these already established techniques. Now, fuzzing success story. Why should you consider to fuzz your code base? It's very effective in bug hunting. If you see today's CVE list, you will uh, see that a lot of the CVEs are coming from uh, like fuzzing the code base. Uh, all these logos here, Google Chrome, Firefox, Linux, Jetpack, Nginx, uh, add a flash player, all these, uh, all these uh, applications, uh, people found bugs in them using different fuzzing techniques. So fuzzing is very successful. Fuzzing is, su is successful in finding codes, in finding bugs in your code. For example, if you take cluster fuzz, uh, it's a fuzzing platform uh, from Google, which was able to found 25,000 plus bugs in Google Chrome. And then it also uh, were able to find 22,000 bugs in over 340 open source projects. So we can say that safely that fuzzing is very successful in finding bugs. So you should consider using fuzzing in your code bases. Now, what kind of bugs are we looking at to find using fuzzing? We can start with different type of memory errors like stack overflow, buffer overflow, heap overflow, uh, memory corruption, uninitialized reads, all these bugs, especially those memory safety and type safety bugs we see in C and C++ code base. And fuzzing is not for just for uh, C and C++ codes. We can apply fuzzing to other languages like Python, Go, Fuzzing is possible for other languages as well. And apart from the memory management, management issues, like that's a huge portion of bugs in today's code bases, fuzzing can also help us to identify other sorts of bugs like deadlocks, null pointer, uh, undefined behaviors, runtime memory leaks. So fuzzing is very capable of finding bugs, uh, like this type of bugs. And Fuzzing, which is uh, fuzzing, uh, cannot detect logical issues. So apart from the logical uh, issues that are uh, inherent to your code bases, fuzzing can detect almost all other uh, bugs. Now a simple scenario, like what type of bug are we looking at uh, using fuzzing? Here we have an input buffer that's 32 bytes. Uh, and we are uh, this input buffer can be uh, monitored, can be tracked by the adversary, any adversary. And we are, uh, the first three bytes of the input buffer is kind of indicating type, subtype, and then length. Now there is a conditional statement where we are trying to do is that if the first byte, which is type, is some value, we are talking about 12, and then the others, uh, um, uh, the second byte, which we are indicating as subtype, if it's a certain value, 64, then we have a local buffer of four bytes, and then we will do some uh, mem copy. Now, remember, I was saying like uh, input buffer, it can be uh, uh, it can be monitored, it can be tracked by the adversary. So this can ultimately lead to uh, a stack buffer overflow because here the local buffer is only four bytes. But length, which is like 
which is like monitored by that uh, uh, attacker or adversary can be a very large number other than uh, four. So this can, this can ultimately lead to a stack buffer overflow, but only if we have these certain values, like we are giving the first byte is 12, second byte is 64, and the third byte length is greater than four. So then it will trigger this particular condition, uh, particular bug. And if any of these values mismatches, the bug will not be triggered. So if we have unit testing or feature testing, uh, it's highly unlikely that this bug will be triggered. But fuzzing will be able to trigger this bug because it fits random data to your program. So this is kind of a, a like motivating example to give you some context where fuzzing can uh, exceed the limitations of feature testing or unit testing. So what is fuzzing? We have been talking about all the like fuzzing success stories and everything. Uh, so it's about, it's a subset of security testing. As part of our software development cycle, we do some testing to understand how our code is performing, to understand that different features in our code is working. Then we have security testing to understand that the security of our code base, like different security primitives are, are in, uh, in, you know, the integrity is uh, uh, like, we are good with the integrity and everything. Then fuzzing comes as a subset of our security testing. It's, come, uh, it's kind of a, a negative testing. Instead of trying to understand the functionality of the code, we will try to trigger different unexpected, unspecified, or erroneous behavior by feeding random inputs uh, to the code. And there are different popular fuzzers that are widely used to name some, uh, American Fuzzy Lob or AFL, AFL++, Leaf Fuzzer, Hong Fuzz. These couple of fuzzers are very widely used. So now that we know what is fuzzing, we will take one step more to understand how fuzzing actually works. So uh, in the beginning, we are talking about manual code review, static analysis, dynamic analysis. So fuzzing falls into the category of dynamic software analysis technique, and we are targeting to detect bugs and security issues by automatically generating and feeding input to a system under test. So for example, we have a system under test. It can be a browser, it can be a server, any program application you have. We are monitoring it. The fuzzer is generating some random input. Uh, by random, we can have our own algorithms, how to generate inputs. We'll come to that in our later slides. And then we are testing by feeding those inputs to our target. And we are under, trying to understand how the system is reacting to all these mutated or random inputs. A bit more detail about the steps, all the steps included in fuzzing. First, we need to identify our target system. Our target system can be uh, any browser, server, uh, it can be any image-based library like uh, JPEG, LibPNG, any libraries. Then we need to determine the inputs. In fuzzing terminology, we can also say it as seeds that we will feed it to our program. Then we will generate some fuzz data and we will execute tests with our fuzz data. Next, we need to monitor or analyze our system behavior and finally, we will log all the crashes and try to find the issues. So the whole goal is to try to generate random input and then feed it to your program, try to understand how it's behaving and see the crashes. That means how we can lead to some particular crashes. And the, from the crashes, we will track back to the original issues. That means where the bug actually happened. Any questions so far? Up to this part, we are good. Cool. So one of the contact uh, terminology that we should know about fuzzing is fuzzing harness, uh, which is very important part of fuzzing. It's called the entry point of your fuzzer. And in more like layman terms, it can be like test target or test cases. To give you an example, if you take a server client program, the harness of or the fuzzing harness can be like 
just starting the server process or checking the input before we establish the connection. It can be an image-based library like libpng, libjpg, and the fuzzing harness can be some program API that, take, uh, that takes any PNG formatted input and we are performing operations on it. Now we know about what is fuzzing, what are different steps involved in fuzzing. Let's look at different types of fuzzing. The first one is uh, based on input generation. We talked previously that we are generating input for our fuzzers, then how we are generating the input based on this criterion, we can divide the fuzzing into two different categories. The first is mutation-based fuzzing, which means we are generating input by modifying the provided input seeds. If it's a, a PNG uh, library, then we can provide some PNG as a first seed or input, then the fuzzer will take it and will try to mutate it. By mutating, we can do something like flipping some of the beads, replacing some of the beads, or deleting some blocks. And that's how we can mutate some of our uh, inputs. An example of mutation-based fuzzing is EFL, EFL++, that means American Fuzzy Lob. Then there comes generation-based fuzzing. When we don't know anything about how our input will look like, we don't know much, uh, so then we can fall. Uh, then we can use this particular category, where we can generate the input from scratch. Uh, maybe we have the grammar of what the input will look like. Then, based on the grammar and everything, we can use that to create some input uh, seeds. And an example is speech, which is a grammar-based fuzzer, which uh, generates the input based on the input grammar provided. So that's uh, one type of fuzzing category. The other types is like based on the awareness of the program structure. The program that our target program, we don't know anything about how the program will look like, what are different functionalities there. So based on it, we can divide the whole fuzzing process, like fuzzing into three categories, black box, white box, and gray box. Black box fuzzing means uh, we don't know anything about fuzzing, and uh, we will just generate input faster because we don't have much idea. We can do some random mutation to generate the inputs. The main problem with black box fuzzing is that it can only detect shallow bugs because we don't have the awareness of how the program will look like, different uh, program states. So it's very possible that our fuzzer will get stuck to only finding shallow bugs. Usually when our target program is very large, we don't know much about all the components in the target program, people usually use uh, black box fuzzing. It still gives us some low hanging fruits, but if we need uh, to find all the bugs in the program, it might not be a best fit. Some of the examples are Peach, Defensix, uh, Radamsa, these are all black box fuzzing. Now we know about the uh, program structure, then we can uh, go to use like white box fuzzing. White box uses some form of program analysis beforehand to analyze the program. For example, if we are using uh, a client uh, a browser, we will first do some analysis like symbolic execution or some sort of dynamic uh, uh, data flow analysis beforehand to understand how the program looks like different states of the program. The problem is that it may require longer time because we are doing a lot of analysis along with our uh, fuzzer. White box fuzzing is also used in industry and academia. Some are, uh, these are some of the examples. Sage, which uses symbolic execution. Then there is another one. So Black box fuzzing is that when we don't know anything about the program, white box means that we don't know a lot about the program. That means we have the complete analysis of the whole program. And then comes gray box fuzzing, which falls right in between black box and white box fuzzing. Here we are doing a very lightweight program instrumentation to collect some feedback about the program. That means when we are targeting a new branch in the program, we will collect the feedback. 
and we will give an initial seed corpus or some input to feed the uh, to feed the fuzzer, and we will collect some coverage based on it. Apple, Hong fuzz, these are all gray box fuzzing, and in today's industry, gray box fuzzing is the most widely used one because it gives us the benefits of both of the worlds, both black box when we don't know anything, white box when we have uh, all the knowledge, but it's very slow. Gray box fuzzing is uh, falls in between, but it gives you the uh, benefit of having some of the uh, understanding about what's going on in your code, and also it's faster than white box fuzzing. So how can we, we talked about uh, getting some feedback coverage in our gray box fuzzing, and how can we get the coverage? So one important aspect of fuzzing is that getting feedback, that means we are feeding random inputs to our fuzzer, and we need to understand how uh, the program is behaving. So that's where the feedback comes into play. Uh, we are observing the behavior, we are feeding the seeds, so template, by template it can be generational based fuzzer, then we are fuzzing the input, targeting, and then we are getting the feedback. Now why feedback is important? So without feedback, it can be act as a blind fuzzing, that means we don't know anything, we are feeding input, we are monitoring, we don't have much idea what's going on. And we can only observe if there is a crash uh, in our program, but not much more than. So the problem without feedback is that we can get stuck into finding uh, very shallow bugs, and we will not be able to find new paths or deeper code bugs. So that's where uh, feedback mechanisms helps us to find more deeper code, bu uh, code bugs. Next, how can we collect feedback? There is a number of ways that you can instrument to collect feedback from your code. One is like statically instrument your code. We can take the help of GCC or LLVM compiler process to instrument the code, then take the feedback and use it. We can also use dynamic instrumentation like pin-based uh, instrumentation to collect our feedback. And the final one is hardware supported tracing. We don't, we no longer need to do all the software, uh, uh, software instrumentation, but we can collect the feedback from uh, Intel processor trace or the last branch record to understand the feedback uh, of our uh, program execution. So we know about uh, different types of fuzzing, why feedback is important, but we also need to know how we can get the best of fuzzers. And one way to get the most out of it is to use fuzzer with different sanitizers. Now, what is sanitizer? It's also a dynamic analysis tool to detect low level violations like memory corruption, undefined behaviors. There are different uh, uh, sanitizers uh, available like address sanitizer, memory sanitizer, undefined behavior sanitizer, threat sanitizer, and fuzzers can be coupled with these, all the sanitizers to detect bugs more efficiently. And we'll, uh, we will see in the next slides how we can use this combo to find more bugs. Uh, we can, so just like how uh, we have been uh, seen the, in the couple of uh, slides back, we, we have seen that how we can use the fuzzer and when we want to use it with sanitizer, we can do it with different environment variables uh, when we are actually compiling the code. So what we will do, we will take the source, take our test, and then compile. Uh, then we will use our compiler wrapper for the fuzzer along with the sanitizer that can be done by just uh, setting your uh, environment variable. And it's also recommended to use only one sanitizer at a time because if we're using multiple sanitizers, it may lead to that uh, we will not find the real bugs. Next, address sanitizer, it detects different type of memory issues. A simple example is here. Uh, we have a buffer of 20 bytes, but when we are returning the buffer, we are actually trying to get ahead of the allocated space. So it's a stack buffer overflow. And we can detect it easily using sanitizer just by enabling our 
uh, compiler flag. For example, here, if we are using just a compiler flag with our, so uh, Clang or Clang is our compiler, and we can use this particular uh, compiler flag, f sanitize to set the, our address sanitizer turned on, and then if we just compile it, and we run it, we can see all the reasons like stack buffer overflow, and it will also gives us the stack traces to pinpoint where the bug actually happened. So that's address sanitizer. Another example is undefined behavior sanitizer, and the round of code, pretty simple code. It's also C. We are having a very integer K, which is, which is taking a very large number. And we are trying to add something here, which is getting first the limit of uh, signed integer. So it will trigger some undefined behavior uh, within the code. So when we uh, run it, just like the previous one, we run it, we, uh, we run this example code with our environment variable undefined sanitizer to track any undefined variable, any undefined behavior, and we run it, then we, it gives us that signed integer overflow. So this is just to show that there are different sanitizers. Uh, I have just shown examples for address sanitizer and uh, undefined behavior sanitizer. There can be a memory sanitizer for uninitialized reads. Uh, there can be thread sanitizer for detecting data arrays. Uh, and uh, a lot of, and you can also build your own sanitizer. Now, how can we use the combo together with fuzzer so that we, uh, we identify the bugs as fast as possible? So this is a screenshot from American Fuzzy Lob. Uh, this is the GUI version of it. This shows how long it has been running, some cycle process, fuzzing strategy. And here is the, our main interest point, which gives us the number of crashes happened and number of unique crashes. So we run the program with our fuzzer and we see how many crashes happened. Fuzzer also give you the uh, inputs that triggered uh, these particular uh, crashes. So in the previous slide, we have seen that there has been three unique crashes in our program when we run it with fuzzer FL++ in this case. It's giving us three unique crashes and we try to see what inputs uh, happen to trigger these particular crashes. So it gives us three, uh, three input for three different crashes. And then we can like uh, regenerate the same crashes uh, using this particular input, which gives us all the stack, uh, stack traces to identify to pinpoint the bug. So in this way, we can combine sanitizer, which gives us all the stack traces and everything. In the fuzzer world, it gives us the crashes, the number of crashes, what input triggered. And if we combine the both, we can find all the inputs that uh, trigger different crashes, and we can then use the different traces to pinpoint our bug. A simple way to find bugs uh, as early as possible. So we have seen fuzzing, we have seen all the goods of fuzzing, but just running your code with your fuzzer is not enough. Um, it can lead to different uh, problems. And if we categorize all the challenges or roadblocks, the first one would be input generation, execution engine, coverage well, evaluating fuzzing effectiveness. So one of the challenges is that input generation. I'm not sure uh, if you have watched the Squid Game. At Squid Game, uh, there was one segment where different people get different type of uh, uh, shapes here. So uh, in case input generation is that we want to generate different interesting inputs so that it can lead to crashes. But if we don't know the knowledge of the input structure, or uh, if we don't know anything, if it is simple, then the fuzzer will find the bug very easily. But if it's a very complex input structure, the fuzzer will have a very hard time to identify the input structure to trigger interesting crashes, which will defeat our purpose of uh, finding bugs. So input generation or generating interesting input that will lead to successful crashes uh, is very important. And if you don't know much about the input structure, 
uh, it will be a huge roadblock for fuzzing, for finding bugs. Then the challenge is coming from the execution engine. Our target is to find bugs and find them as early as possible in a very fast way. But if our execution engine is slow, then our bug discovery will be slow, uh, which will ultimately defeat the purpose of using fuzzer. So having an optimized execution engine is a must. Then the coverage wall. That means at certain point, no matter how long we are fuzzing, if we are not fuzzing good enough, we might get stuck to a particular program point. That means a shallow code paths. If there are like sequence of uh, conditional checks or anything, that there is a good chance that the fuzzer will not find those bugs. So another huge problem in fuzzing is that we can, we can get stuck. We can get stuck to only finding very shallow bugs. We are not, uh, if there is a checksum in, uh, involved in our code base uh, with a huge conditional chains, there's a good chance that the fuzzer will not get it uh, because to satisfy all the conditional checks in the chain and then to trigger the bug, it's hard. And the next one is evaluating fuzzing effectiveness. We know that fuzzer can find bugs, but how can we measure the I have found all the bugs in the code. There are no more bugs, and we have achieved all the uh, code coverage. And this percentage, maybe we have uh, lead, uh, we have uh, reached to seventy percent of the codes in our program. Is this good? Is this good enough? Do we need to go to a hundred percent? So all these things may lead up uh, our fuzzing not very successful. So what are the solution to solve all this problem? The input generation problem that we were talking where we are not able to, we, we might not be able to like uh, generating interesting inputs. We can switch back to grammar-based fuzzing for better in input generation. So instead of relying on different mutation-based fuzzing, we can use the input grammar so that even if the input structure is uh, very complex, but when we know the grammar, uh, we can generate interesting inputs for our fuzzer. We can also combine additional analysis, symbolic execution. Just because we are using fuzzing, it doesn't uh, make us not to use other uh, static analysis techniques. We can use symbolic execution. We can do some uh, lightweight taint analysis to give more context about the fuzzer to generate more interesting uh, um, inputs for our program. And then finally, the crash rising and coverage analysis. Crash rising is the one that we have seen earlier. That means we have the number of crashes that lead to uh, uh, inputs that lead to the crashes, and we can use them to re-trigger those crashes, find our bugs. And for coverage analysis, it means that how can we measure that we have triggered all the code paths in the program? It's very. It's not just in fuzzing. Coverage analysis is used in uh, other testing uh, software testing mechanism. And this information is used to make like input, uh, informed decision how we want to uh, like mutate our input. For example, if a certain input trigger a particular uh, crash, um, the fuzzer will want to the fuzzer may, might want to mutate that input further because it has been triggered uh, successful crashes before. So those kind of tr um, inputs might be more interesting for fuzzer for us to find bugs. And how can we understand that we have fuzzed enough? We can use different metrics, like uh, different coverage metrics, like basic blocks, uh, different branch condition. That means if my program has 20,000 basic blocks, maybe we have covered like, uh, uh, if it's 20,000, maybe we have covered 18,000, maybe it's a good enough. If there are uh, 10,000 branches in my program, if we can cover 80% 80, 80 of them, that's good enough. Or we can sort to path analysis, how many code paths we have actually explored. So this solution can help us to get the most benefits of our puzzle. And now that we know the solution, so far all the information context, we're mostly from software, but uh, software are not, is not the only piece of code. Then there can be firmware. How about hardware? Can we use fuzzing for firmware? Can, uh, are we good enough in the, you know, like what's the kind of research trend for hardware fuzzing? So just a little bit about firmware fuzzing. 
We have seen the challenges for software fuzzing. For firmware fuzzing, there are even more challenges. Why? We have some dependency on hardware. Uh, if, for example, if it's a UFI uh, firmware, we need to connect with the hardware. The performance will be slow because uh, there are a lot of dependencies. How can we trace the coverage? For software, these issues were very simple. We were able to uh, like answer those questions. But how about firmware fuzzing? Can we use it? There are a number of ways researchers these days are working to trigger to resolve these issues. One is like simulating or emulating the behavior the way we are connecting with the hardware. Then we can also use uh, some of the verification harness that comes with uh, the, uh, like the program to compile it into a Linux-based user space binary. We can also try rehosting the code manually to resolve the problems we just mentioned. And that's for firmware fuzzing. And there comes also hardware fuzzing. It's still a very new research area where people are trying to fuzz hardwares, like the way we fuzz softwares or firmwares. But then the problem is the challenge is more because uh, how can we emulate the whole behavior of the fuzzer, the correctness of the emulation or simulation? So that's all for to think for us. So in summary, I think I hope you have learned something new. It was useful for you. Uh, I hope we all agree that fuzzing has been a very effective tool to find bug, uh, to find any potential security issues in our code. And it will not replace all the established techniques, but it will augment or it, it can help us to find the bugs in a more fastest way. And just like fuzzing your code is not enough. If we are not fuzzing in a right way, chances are that you are not discovering all the bugs in your program. So it's important to understand what are the roadblocks of your program, what, are the, what is the fuzzing technique is suited for your program, is it a generation-based fuzzer, or is it a mutational fuzzer, or what kind of uh, feedback you need? Is it, do you need like a black box fuzzing is enough for you? Or do you want different type of uh, gray box or with different instrumentation for your program? So all these pieces are important to get the most out of fuzzing techniques to find bugs in your code. So with that, thank you and questions. Any questions? We have a microphone. I'm going to walk back and check Discord here. We had one earlier. Does fuzzing incur false positive or false negative? Right. So uh, fuzzing have very false, uh, have very less false positive because uh, we have all the dynamic, uh, like runtime context. But it uh, incurs a lot of false negatives because uh, if we don't uh, give the perfect inputs, chances are that we are missing the uh, bug. So in short, like very few false positives, unlike static analysis techniques, but a lot of false negatives can happen. Well, wait a minute, a false negative, that's not good. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Well, like you need, like you can, you can, you can use then the crash tracing things, like to understand whether. Uh, so some crashes they might be exploitable. Some crashes those are those might not be exploitable. So you can use the crash tracing to understand whether this crash is actually exploitable or not. How long do we need to run the fuzzer, or when to stop? Right, so like we can run our fuzzer. So the industry standard is like running it like, uh, like 24 hours at a time, and then like uh, doing it all over again. But to understand that we have fuzzed enough is like if we get a good coverage, maybe 80% or 95% uh, of our uh, basic blocks are covered, or 80% of our uh, conditional checks are covered then we can understand, hey, we have a good coverage. We have hit almost all the code paths or program points in, a, uh, in our code, so we are good. So, um, so in summary, in short, like if we have a good coverage, I guess uh, we are good that we have fast enough. We, might, we have found like, almost all the bugs maybe uh, in the program. 
Yeah, you know, I think you, you kind of accidentally answered the, the other question, which was, do you have an indication to understand whether all the bugs have been caught? And I think you kind of answered it with the second question. Right. So, yeah, fuzzing is not like sound or complete. That means because you, it's very probabilistic approach. That means we are generating the input. We are feeding it randomly. Uh, we cannot guarantee that we have uh, like found all the bugs in the program. But there's a good chance if we have a good coverage that we have covered all the programs. That's any other question from anyone? Any questions from anyone here? I'll keep an eye on Discord. Should I start a quiz? I think if you started promising <laughs> prizes, they would just jump to, I don't know. <laughs> right. So yeah, thank you everyone for listening uh, here in person, in virtual. And if you have any question, if you don't want to ask or well, if you have any question uh, later, just shoot me an email or uh, you can also catch me in uh, social media. Thank you again for attending the talk.